All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to one of our several product announcement sessions here at MongoDB World, where you can learn more about new features that have been released. In this session, Katya will give an overview of change streams and we'll share some exciting new features with change streams and give an overview of the available tools. Katya Kamaneva is a senior product manager at MongoDB. Since 2019, Katya has been working on the core database with the query team, where she is contributing to the querying capabilities and features like uh, aggregation framework, change stream, schema validation, and more. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, Tonya. Hello, morning. It's fine. <laughs> um, Martin, thank you so much for coming. I know it's early. Other sessions are great. There's a great session on data modeling by Daniel, so if you get bored here, please go there. Daniel is great. <laughs> I, would, I would go there if I, if I didn't have to be here. Um, so we have like a cozy bunch. Can I just get like a show of hands who are already using change streams? Okay, so not everybody. Okay, uh, then I'll go through my planned agenda for just showing, first like tell like what is it uh, to introduce to those who don't know yet. Uh, and then we can go into the new features that for existing users might be interested in what we've added. So why you might be interested, sorry for increase. Why you might be interested in the chain streams, like here's one of the examples of the use case. Let's say you have an uh, online store, uh, people place orders, uh, you process them, you ship them, um, maybe you want to do something like the order has shipped, so the status changed, and now you want to add that order to the tracking board when you track it with a, um, with a, like a USPS and see if it's stuck or not. Uh, then maybe order is completed and you want to update your metrics that shows how quickly you process orders in general. Or maybe the inventory went down, the product is low in stock, you need to kick off the process of ordering more. Um, so this is the kind of the use cases where chain streams may be handy because chain stream allowed to monitor the events that happen in your MongoDB database so you can react to changes in near real time. Like other use cases maybe you need to feed data to the data warehouse and like from multiple sources and MongoDB is one of the sources. Um, or you want to keep some other system in sync maybe there's a worker in factory, they have a handheld device, um, and they need to get like the up-to-date information about the inventory. By the way, consider Atlas Sync for that. Um, and also something like business logic like we looked before, maybe whenever a team member takes vacation for more than two days, kick off recalculation of the schedule for entire project, something like that. So in practice, it looks something like this. This is an example for the shell. Um, so database orders is our collection and we use the helper watch. So this is the helper that is usually used across all the drivers to start the chain stream. So we want to watch for changes on the collection orders. Then let's say we insert the document. So it's a very little document, it has ID, customer name, uh, what they ordered, the product, and the status of the, um, of the order. Then we iterate on the cursor, and this is what we get on the right. Um, this is what we get in the message uh, from the chain stream. We get information like meta about the event, that this is the insert type, there's a timestamp, uh, information about the uh, database and collection, but like in green you see the full document, so this is basically the document that was inserted. You can see it's like the same that um, from the insert command. Then let's say we do update. So we update one order and we said we change the status, we flip it from new to shipped. Now uh, we see that the operation type is now different and the, instead of the document we have update description. So that update description will contain uh, the new values of the fields. So now the status is shipped. So some basic things about the chain streams. You can open chain stream on the collection, on the database, or on the entire cluster. Events are originating from the op log. So op log is used for replication. 
So you have to have a replica set with the op lock. You will not see, you cannot use change stream on the single node that you just spun up on your local machine without the, uh, the op lock. I think there's actually the option to have an op lock like to spin up the single node with the op lock, but like in general, it's for replica sets because it's using this op lock. So your chain streams, uh, so your uh, chain stream events, actually, they can be started in the past. So you can read events that happen in the past as long as you stay within the window of your op lock. And that is also like configurable. You can configure it by time or by the size. So you can resume from the point of the last event that you saw. So if like there is a network disconnect, uh, if your application was unavailable, um, you get the resume token from the last event that you saw, um, and you start again, you, like, yeah, you resume chain stream and you pass the token, it will start at the same time to make sure that you do not read any events twice or uh, that you actually receive all the events. And you can apply additional filters and projections uh, because like chain streams are actually like powered by aggregation framework. So you can put additional stages in the definition of your chain stream, like a dollar match for filtering or like dollar project or dollar set, and just like modify that event that you get in a little bit. And like, yeah, or just like filter things that you're not interested in. Okay, now we switch into what's new in chain streams. So one thing is uh, pre and post images. This is what we call the version of the document before change and after change. Why would you want this? Maybe you want to get the snapshot of the document as it, as it was after the, uh, after the update operation and maybe like, yeah, send it to the data warehouse. Or maybe you want to evaluate the change in the value. Uh, as we said, like about the, the like vacation, we really need to know that, that like, um, let's say, no, vacation is not a good example. Let's say we, we're tracking the flights and the schedule of the flight changed, like it got late for 10 minutes. So our logic can be, if it got late for more than 10 minutes, then do something else, like recalculate schedule for the entire crew. But if it's less, then we don't really care, just proceed as normal. Or you need a field from the document uh, that was deleted. So the document is deleted, but you need that field. For example, you have a like, content management system. Uh, user creates a draft, has some attachments, and then it's like, okay, actually I don't need it. Um, so you're trying to delete the draft, but in that document that represents the draft, there are also links to some files on S3. So you need to purge those files. You need like, to know the location of those files. If the document is deleted, you no longer have them. Um, yeah, of course, like usually there are workarounds for like you mark it as like you flip the flag for deleted one, then do your purge and then you go back and actually remove that file. So that's like a workaround for not having this. So before 6.0, all the insert and replace operations did have post image because it's like natural. That's only thing that you know uh, when you insert. But for a per update, uh, we didn't really have pre image or post image. What we had. Uh, like point in time post image. What we had is like the latest version of the document. So let's say now it's, let's say nine o'clock and I start my chain stream and look back 10 minutes and I watch for the changes of the documents. So the first change I read, they say, okay, my value changed to two. But if I also say, I want to know, include the post image, there's actually values files. Like why? Because there were three more updates after that, and actually currently the value is five. So you read, let's say, five changes of the same document says the value became two, three, four, five, but the post image is always says that it's five. So like, it's not sometimes what you want, sometimes it's good enough, sometimes it's not what you want. Um, and for delete operations, there were really, yeah, no pre-image and no post image. Well, no post image because you deleted it, but no pre-image, which was bad. Um, so, now in 6.0, what's coming up is actually point in time pre and post images. So actually the version of the document as it was right before or right after the operation. So you need to enable it per collection. Uh, by default, uh, it's disabled. Uh, you can configure the retention for how long you want to retain those uh, pre-images. By default, they're gonna be stored for as long as your op window. Uh, 
So basically, if you can read event that happened an hour ago because you still have opoc for it, you also can get the pre-image. But if you see that like I don't really need it, I usually process my chain streams like within 10 minutes or something, you can trim that to save some space. Uh, yes, and there are uh, options for uh, opening chain streams to include the pre-image and post-image. The full document is the post image, like the version after update, and full document before change uh, is the version before. So this is how it looks like when you uh, enable it on the collection. You can do it with a, on existing collection like this with a command call mod, or you can do it during collection creation. Set it right there. And this is how you open the chain stream and ask to include those um, pre-images and post-images, actually post-images and pre-images. So now this cursor actually will return you both what we saw before plus the, um, the versions of the document. So now the delete operation would look like this. So you see operation type delete. Before, like we didn't have this full document before it changed. We only had document key. So in document key, you have ID of the document and shard key if it's sharded. So that's the only thing that you had before. And now we can actually see what was the document before it was deleted. So you can reference those things like date placed or status uh, or whatever you need. And for update, we can have both. We can have the document after and we can have document uh, before. So, now, basically, now pre and post images will be available for all the events when it's relevant. So, for uh, it's, uh, for the replace uh, for the updates events, you're going to have b both before version and after. For replace events, like replace events, it's not really like um, it's not like you, not always like you decide to replace, but like sometimes the logic of the server like decides that this should be replaced. Like if the changes out to uh, the document are like so big that it's easier to replace rather than like applying it like field by field. Sometimes you will get replace event um, instead of the update, but it doesn't mean it actually may be the um, the outcome of you still using the like collection dot update, um, but you will get the replace event. Um, and this is actually one of the workarounds, like to use the specific like replacement or to get the post image, right? Like, because then you uh, you actually have a, like the, the whole thing. Um, so you will have pre-image for replacement, and you will have pre-image for deletes. Um, and for just like few options, we saw that I specified required before, so like full image required, full uh, before image required. Uh, so it means that I want to receive error if it's not available. Uh, but the result should to also say when available, so it means like it's an optional field for me, then it may be null um, if it's not there. So if you specify required um, and you receive an error, it's not transient. So it means like you don't have to retry. If you got an error, it means we don't have that image. It means it's not, you didn't enable in the collection or it got purged um, or, yeah, or there was an election, you, you switched to new node, there was not enough uplog, um, so like it's like it's not something that will go away. Basically, there is no image. All right, next. Um, I, I will go back. Like in the end, I will get into a little bit more details for those who want to stay. Um, but now I'm going to shift to the next thing. Um, so the new feature, another new feature in 6.0 that will now report also DDL, DDL events. So before we only reported events about the data change. And only certain events when we need it for like to still like work with chain stream. So like if collection is deleted, the chain stream will be, in, will be invalidated. So you kind of know that collection was deleted. But in this case, you can also know that the index was created, that collection was uh, sharded, that the view was created. And there is a new option to enable it. So by default, uh, you will not see those events. You will still receive only data changes. But if you want to know those, um, you use the show expanded events uh, and you will get those events. Yeah, so this is the, the option that you pass. And this is an example of the create index. So it shows you the spec of the index. And this is an example of the creation of the view. Um, it's called create, so it's like create collection, but you see it says like it's view on and there is a pipeline that defines that view. So yeah, this may be handy if you're like trying to keep another like cluster in sync. Maybe you have like a 
production and uh, development environment. You want to make sure like all the indexes that are created on production also go to dev. But like I'd like to remind you that there is new uh, cluster to sync to cluster sync tool. So if you're really looking for like replicating MongoDB clusters, maybe that's going to be a better like out of the box uh, solution for you. Right, the next one is uh, optimized user pipelines. So this actually happened in the dot release. So we have now like this rapid releases during the year that are available on Atlas for production. So like those previ two previous features will, are in 6.0, so you'll not see like in Atlas, but this is actually in Atlas, so you can play with it. So what was happening before is that when you split your chain streams into multiple, so like let's say you want, you expect like more efficient processing if let's say I want to divide them I will go like all the inserts will go on this stream and all these updates will go on this stream uh, and all or maybe like by collection like sometimes it's it wasn't actually very efficient uh, so after this optimization we have seen about twice higher throughput when you actually try to like divide your chain streams into more like distinct ones so how do you actually like do this? This is the example when I mentioned earlier that you can apply uh, projection and filter. So match is a filter. So we say that we only care about events where the field estimate was changed. So it's present in the update description. And in the project, we only care about that estimate field. So we'll only include that one field. We don't care about any other 10 fields that have changed. So this way we first like we filter out a bunch of other changes, so we just get those. And with the projects, we really trim the size of the event to just the document key and, the, and this estimate value, so it becomes very small. So for uncharted uh, clusters, um, really the, the projection or the filter uh, sometimes makes a good difference, and for sharded clusters also projection uh, helps when it mean, like makes the document smaller because on chartered clusters, so, okay, just one step back. Um, so as we said earlier, chain streams are using aggregation pipeline and aggregation pipeline is like stage on stage on stage. So the first stage is to go read from the op log um, what happened in the database. So this optimization basically tries to move the filter you specified in the projections like earlier. So if you say, I only know, want that one estimate field on the first step when we go into the op log we will get like let's say before we were getting all the 10 documents that were relevant for that collection today we're getting just one that includes the change of that one field so only like fewer documents will go now travel through that pipeline further when it will be like transformed to the change stream event it's going to be enriched by the, like resume information and further 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 and give it back to user uh, and on the shoulder cluster we also have MongoS and we have all these multiple shards that do work. So now if we use projection and our documents are smaller, it means like just like smaller amounts of information travel to MongoS. So it's just like we use it like less, less network, we can like process more messages. Um, so, so it's better. Few other additions. Um, I believe the, this is like the different like uh, time frame. So like this one, I think is in 6.0. So now we also include the wall time field in the chain streams. It's basically the same. Like if you ever looked in the op log, there is a wall uh, field that contains like the, the timestamp and the date format. So now it also will be available in the chain stream. It's like a millisecond precision. It may give you like better, like if you want to parallelize your chain streams uh, events and then like bring them back. So you have this like precision to put them in the right order. And uh, also a few things for the timestamp. You can convert it to date now. And uh, you can also extract the pieces of the timestamp, the second part and the increment part. So this is, for example, if you want to actually split the chain streams by time and say, like, I want to uh, receive every third event or something, then you can do, like, little just, like, basic math of, like, I'm going to add up the seconds and increment and then... Um, get like the, um, the mod of three or something. Based on that, I will split it into three. So, so you can do that. So I wanted to also mention the available tools and interfaces for the chain stream. So Mongosh, the Mongosh shell is like the easiest thing to just like 
give it a try and see what is it, like the no code needed, just like, um, then of course you can use it language drivers. It, they have like all the, all the needed helpers for that. There is a Kafka connector. If you want to plug in Kafka on top of the chain stream, there is a connector um, developed by MongoDB that kind of helps you with that. Um, and uh, Atlas database triggers are also based on the chain stream. So it's like the hosted service when you can um, program the reaction of the chain stream uh, right in Atlas. So you do not have to do it in your application. You can do it in the Atlas UI. Um, you can actually like execute another, uh, like similar to like data, to like actually in database triggers, you can write the code to actually do something in the database, like in one of the Atlas clusters, uh, or you can send it to, um, to some other system. And the QR code is just the tiny, like just file that I created with like links, um, and I'll be adding some more information there. Okay, now some tech details for those who survived to this point. So the pre and post images, when you enable it, they are stored in the system collection. It's gonna be one single system collection for uh, all the collections that you enable it. You don't have to actually do anything with it, it's just, it's just gonna be there. The post images will be calculated during the chain stream execution. Uh, so we only store the pre-image, but if you request the post-image, it will be uh, calculated based on the uh, update that happened. When you enable chain streams, uh, the pre-images, it doesn't really impact the upload window. So it's like, imagine that like, if the fact that there was a new document that collection went to the upload, it means now we kind of using the upload, <laughs> right, and getting smaller because like we're also storing all those images, so we're not doing that. Um, we only store uh, when we purge that collection, so the documents get deleted, we only store that part in the upload, but it's also like using the really cool new, like uh, efficient delete scene where it's like compacted, multiple deletes in one message, it's, like, it's really not, not a lot of impact, so don't worry about the upload window, or at least if it's a problem, let me know, I hope it's not. Um, uh, then when you enable point in time images, it does add some overhead to your writes because we have to write that image in the collection. So it may add some um, overhead and yeah, and of course it's user storage. Uh, but if we compare the point in time image with that image when we are doing just, just give me the current, the, the current version, then in terms of the efficiency of the reading the chain stream, the point in time image is better. Um, because when we do the current version, we basically go and do like look up into the actual collection. So we like use index to get the ID of the document, we fetch the document, uh, but when we use this new collection, it's like clustered collections, it's efficient, uh, we can get the document right away, so it's like the, it's gonna be faster uh, the, for the chain stream itself. Then, for the optimization. Um, so if you already have some user-defined filter on the chain stream, it's very likely that you will just see that it got a little faster. Um, but not all the, not like 100% of what you filter on uh, can be pushed down. It's like it's an optimization, something can, something can also like, so if, like if it's like simple high-level things, um, like uh, like type of the operation, like high level, uh, like top level fields that are updated, um, but not like pre-image, because like pre-image, injection of the pre-image happens later in, in this process, so if you filter on it, it's like it's not in the upload, right? So we cannot, uh, we cannot filter for it uh, early. Or if it's some very complex, like nested five level array, and you filter on that field, this probably also will not be, um, and only push down because it's too complex. Um, and also the same kind of similar thing for projections. Like when your projection really reduces the size of the document, it was huge and I was just like two fields, you probably will see the benefits. Uh, but if it's so complex that you do some calculations, you, I don't know, like some the array calculate the average and I don't know what else, like it actually may be complex enough that 
the compute will actually take more time, so it's gonna be less efficient. So based on what you do, like sometimes like you need to like decide like the trade-off. Do you want to do it on a server or do you want to do it on a client? Maybe it's gonna be actually faster. All right, and now some general questions that we hear uh, often, I guess, not regarding the new features. Like how close am I to the end of the op log? So as we said, like because we read from the op log, uh, we need to know if we are close to falling behind um, because if, if we had an outage or something, we need to resume, I don't know, a day back or something. Um, we need to know that we have those events available. So if you're using Atlas, Ops Manager, Cloud Manager, there are like monitoring tools that can you can help you like alert about the op log window. Uh, if you need to really like, oh, oh, I even have an illustration. Um, yeah, if you really need to just uh, check quickly, you can just query the op log collection um, and see what's your what's your earliest time there, what's the time of the latest event. Uh, you can zoom to compare them and, and figure out like, will you be able to keep up or not? Um, then the problem of the noisy neighbor. So let's say these are like the dots are all the different events. Um, and we are watching only for events that are green. So as you see, these black events that we don't really care about, they're so frequent, they, they kind of push out the events that we care about. So let's say we consume that event in the past that is in green. And then we need to resume our chain stream. If we try to resume, we got the resume token after that. If you try to resume that, we cannot because it's in the path. Like it's out, it's outside of the op log. The op log doesn't contain uh, that point, doesn't know anything about the resume token, so you'll just get an error. And at this point, basically, you need to start by the timestamp to get like the earliest timestamp from the op log and change start your chain from the very beginning and scan all this irrelevant events to get to the green one. Right? So it's like it's not very efficient. Um, so what drivers have for that, they have get resume token function. So if you even if you don't see your green events, you still can call get resume token from time to time and the resume token will advance to the point, like to the latest point when it's safer to resume. So when you actually use this one, you don't need to scan entire op log, you will just start from the latest point before the event that you just read. So, so it's much better, we call it a high watermark resume tokens, but like, like I know like not all the users use it because the field, there's like underscore ID field in each chain stream event that is actually the resume token. So you can just like grab that value and use it and not use the helper. Uh, but this is like a nice thing that actually the helper makes sense. Okay, it helps you, to, you, you will notice that like when you get the resume token for the event that exists, it's like huge, uh, but if you get this uh, high watermark, it's like tiny because it just contains the, the timestamp. It doesn't get like the identification of the event itself. And is there a risk of ex exceeding the document size limit when you're using both pre and post images? Yes, there is a risk. Um, so for the output of the chain stream, the, the, uh, the limit of the 16 megabytes still applies. Um, basically, your event can be very large up to the point when you actually kind of get it uh, like to, to your client. So uh, what you can do is in this projection pipeline that you have, you can use the dollar $BSON size expression to evaluate the size of your document. You can say, okay, if it's too large, then do something. Like you can, I don't know, create another field or mark it that it's too large. Maybe you need to go like and fetch the document manually or you can trim it and maybe remove some fields that are not um, required. Uh, but basically you can do that in a projection. So like uh, your event can have can be big up to, I think, so it's like it's almost 40, it's not like exactly 48 megabytes because there's like metadata that will be like, so like less than 48 megabytes. So like technically you can have a big event, but to consume it, uh, you still need to uh, trim it down or you'll get an error, unfortunately, as of now. So I think, or oh, was it something that I mentioned? Uh, just one note about the aggregation stages that you're using. Basically, um, you can use all the, 
you can use match for filter and you can use all the projection like stages. You cannot use project, uh, stages that, let's say, like unwind, that makes multiple documents of one or that group because we still need to have all those events like one by one so we can resume from each of them. So that's why you cannot just like unwind and get like five different, uh, like split your one event into multiple documents because uh, like then it's gonna like break the resumability thing. Um, yeah, so, so that's the limitation. I think I went over the time, um, but I'm gonna be here at the build booth on the third floor uh, almost all day, like it's set for like lunchtime. So please come and ask questions. Also in 1015, I'll be covering the new features in query. Here is Kyle, our engineer. So if you have really nerdy question, you can ask him too. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs>